what I'm going to try to do is get through uh, Joshua. We started with, we ended with Deuteronomy last week. And so what I would like to do is get through Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel. So we'll see, see how that goes today if we get through all of them so that we're not too far behind the next time around. But if you, if you think a little bit about Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy was Moses' farewell address to the children of Israel. And so where we're picking it up right now in the book of Joshua, we are at about 1400 BC. So, so we're still way back in there. We've covered a lot, of, a lot of territory in the book of Genesis that slowed down a little bit in Exodus. Exodus covered about 400 years. And then Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy covered about 40 years. So those three books were covering less period of time. The book of Joshua doesn't cover a whole lot of time either. We're looking at about 20 years, maybe even a little bit less than that, that the book of Joshua covers. And then we'll get into the book of Judges, and the book of Judges is going to cover more time again. Ruth is going to slow down, and then Samuel is going to speed up again. So we're kind of going back and forth with some of these. Then after that, we're going to get into the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms covers a lot of time because there are a lot of different authors. Those were gathered together. That's, that's what we'll be taking up in, in two weeks. So Joshua is, a, is about 1400 B.C. Joshua was one of, we, we've heard about Joshua, he was one of the spies that was sent out in the first wave of spies when the Lord brought Israel out of uh, Egypt. Remember they sent the 12 spies into the land. Joshua and Caleb were two of the spies for their tribes. There was one, one spy for each one of the tribes. They came back with a positive report. The other 10 spies came back with a negative report because of that. And the Lord judging the children of Israel and saying, you're going to wander in the wilderness until this generation dies off. The next generation will get the chance to enter into the promised land. Joshua and Caleb were the two exceptions to that rule. So the older generation, and that was the fighting men that were 20 years of age and older, all of that generation died off in the 40 years of wandering. Joshua and Caleb would have been in that age group, but because they trusted in the Lord, the Lord said they would be able to enter into the promised land. So it's kind of interesting if you think about that. We don't know exactly how old Joshua was, but he would have been quite a bit older when they then enter into the promised land than everybody else because he was part of that older generation leading a bunch of younger people into the promised land. So Moses dies on Mount Nebo and the reins of Israel are basically handed over to Joshua. And Joshua then is entrusted with the responsibility of leading the children of Israel over the Jordan River and into the promised land. And your Bibles probably have a map at the back uh, if you want to open up to the back of your Bibles there, mine doesn't have one, but I think these Bibles do. There should be a map. So it's map three in, if you have the, the red Bibles, it has a picture of the conquest of the land of Canaan. This is Palestine. Let's go another one. Okay, so this is the conquest. And then on the next map, right next to it in Roline's Bible, you have the 12 tribes and the way that it's, the, the land is divided up. Uh, you don't have one of those. This is later on. It looks like there might be one missing. Map 3, map 4. But, um, can I borrow your Bible, Roline? I'll just kind of walk around with this. So, so this, this map that you have here shows the, the exodus from Egypt and how they get into the... You have one here too, it looks like. During the 40 years. They are all around right here on the Red Sea. So that's map two. They're wandering around in this. So here's Egypt over here. And Israel is up here by the Mediterranean. And they're basically, they're wandering in this area in the Sinai Peninsula for, for those 40 years. But after those 40 years are over, uh, they come up to the, the uh, let's see, that would be the western, eastern shore of the, the Jordan River. They're on the far side. And they get ready to cross over the Jordan River and into the land of Canaan. Now, there were two tribes. They actually say it was two and a half tribes. Two and a half tribes received land on the eastern side of the Jordan River. 
and that was Reuben, Gad, and what we call the half-tribe of Manasseh. And the reason that we call it the half-tribe is because Manasseh had land on both sides of the river. Mm. So you have two and a half tribes on this side, and you had, how many tribes does that leave you? Nine and a half tribes on the other side. So if you add it up, Judah, Simeon, that's two, Dan, Benjamin, four, Ephraim, Issachar, that's six, uh, Zebulun, Asher, Naphtali, that's nine, and the half tribe of Manasseh is nine and a half. So some of the, the tribes, and this is the way it worked, and we read about this in the book of Joshua, that they, they get up here to the eastern side of the, the Jordan River, and Reuben, Gad, said, we don't want to go over into the promised land. We'd like to have land here. And so Joshua makes a deal with them. He says, if you want to have the land over here on this side, you can have the land over here. But you have to come with the rest of the tribes and help conquer this land, and then you can inherit it. So it's not the kind of thing, it's like your, your kids. They, they'll say, you, you have a snicker bar, and you've got four kids. And they say, well, how are we going to divide this up? And you, you give one, you know, the oldest one, he divides it up and he cuts one and a half and then the other half into three pieces and he takes the big one. So the idea is, no, you know, if you want to divide it up, you let somebody else choose first. My dad always used to say that. He said when there were three boys in his family, he said that his mom's rule was one person divides it, the next person gets to pick first. And he said you could, you could measure those things within a centimeter of each other. They would be exactly the same size because they didn't get a pick. So what Joshua's rule was, is you can have the land wherever you want, but you will go into battle with the other, other tribes and help conquer the land on the other side. So they came in, they conquered the land over here, and then they went back to the other side and Manasseh was split. They inherited some land on, on both sides. So there are a couple of, of striking features in the book of Joshua. Um, Rahab plays a pretty important role in the book of Joshua. She was, a, she was a prostitute that was a Canaanite living in the city of Jericho. Jericho was the first of the cities that the children of Israel conquered. And you can probably find Jericho on your map. If you go to the, the Dead Sea, your map has Salt Sea. And it's just north, just a hair of the Dead Sea. It was one of the very first cities. It was a very formidable city. That was one of the first cities that you would run into when you crossed over the Jordan River. So here's the Jordan River. There's the city of Jericho. And you can see it's right on the, this has um, an elevation sort of in there. You can see it's just right on the slopes of some of the mountains going up. Did you find it? Mm -hmm. So Jericho was the first city that they came to. We were told that, again, they sent spies in. The spies went into the, the city of Jericho in order to spy it out, and they, got, they were found out. Remember that the Canaanite people, one of the interesting things about Joshua is that the Canaanite people heard that they were coming, and they were afraid of them because they had heard what the Lord had done through them over the past 40 years, uh, defeating Og and Bashan, some of the kings of the Amorite uh, countries. So when Jericho heard that they were coming, they were afraid. They heard that there were spies. They tried to hunt them down. And Rahab uh, hides and protects the spies. And because of that, the, the spies said, we will, we will deliver you when we come to conquer the city of Jericho. So they were told to, they told her to hang out a red scarf out of the wall of the city. They would see that that scarf and, and her family then would be spared. Now, archaeology in the city of, of Jericho is a pretty amazing thing. They have uncovered and dug up the city of Jericho, and they have found, amazingly, just like we would expect as Christians who believe that the Bible is true and accurate and it's God's Word, that it was destroyed just exactly like it was described in the book of, of Joshua. Remember, they walked around the city, one time each day, they would do that on the seventh day. They walked around seven times. They blowed, uh, blew their horns and the walls just simply fell to the ground. Well, in digging up the city of Jericho, uh, they found the immenseness of this city. They had two walls that were built on a hill. It was, it was virtually impenetrable in that day. But there's one section of the wall. Now, Rahab's house must have been on the wall because they told her to stick this cord out. They were able to get out of her house and get away from the city. So it had to be a house mounted in the, in the wall of the city, which they had. But there's one section of the wall of Jericho 
that they've dug up that didn't crumble. One section. And it was probably would have been where Rahab's house would have been in order for her to have been saved. But now they're saying an earthquake brought that down. I mean, they're, right. you know. Well, you got to find another excuse as a, as a human beings because it can't be the way God described it, right? It's biblical. Yep. I, you know. Yep. Yeah. Oh, the biblical archaeology. Yeah. yeah. Even those, a lot of times they want to try to explain it away with natural events and yeah. But this whole land that they're going to promise, the one with milk and honey, was morally corrupt, wasn't it? It was, and one of the things I'd like to talk about when we, we talk about the book of Joshua, we're, we're talking about the conquest of this land, and one of the questions that often comes up, a lot of times even by Christians, and we read it over and over again in the book of Joshua and even in the book of Judges, was the fact that the Lord sent the children of Israel into that land, and He said, wipe them out. Women, children, Animals, I mean, it is everything. It is it's a complete devastation. Now, part of this was that the Lord wanted the people to trust in Him with the destruction of the animals that was considered property, but He wanted them to trust. You know, you don't need this. You, you need to trust in Me. I will provide for you. There was a second part, and the morally corrupt aspect that you brought up, Charles, is very important because He he said, over and over again, both in Deuteronomy and in Joshua, we read the fact that if you do not destroy them, they will become a thorn in your side. They will lead you away from the worship of the true God. So not only were they morally corrupt, but they were also spiritually corrupt. They worshipped false gods and idols that did, even in the book of Joshua, we see that becoming a, a, a bit of a problem. Not as much as what we're going to see in the book of Judges, but in Joshua we do see part of that. And, and so what I'd like to do is I'd like to back up to, to Genesis chapter 15 for a minute. We talked about Genesis a while back, but there's an important verse that I'd like to read here that helps us to understand why God was as harsh through the children of Israel as He was in this time. And we, we want to remember that God does not say the same thing today. He doesn't send us as Christians to wipe people out. The, the Muslims are like that. You know, they, they get a badge uh, for, for killing others who are not Islamic. We don't want to make that same comparison with, with the children of, of Israel. God's intent has always been to save all people. But there was a specific reason, or maybe even two reasons, why God sends His people in in order to wipe out entirely these Canaanite nations. So I'd like to start with verse 13, Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. And let's read down to 16. Why don't everybody take a verse? Jolene, you want to start with verse 13, Sally 14, uh, Charles 15, and Roline 15? Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. So let me back up just a little bit. This is the Lord talking to Abraham. And he's prophesying to Abraham what's going to happen in the future. He says, you're going to go down to Egypt. Your, your descendants are going to go down there. They're going to become slaves. They're going to be down there for 400 years and be enslaved. So we've talked about that at the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus. We saw that prophecy fulfilled. Go on, Sally. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. And afterward, they will come out with great possessions. Charles? Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Okay, so... And it's this last verse that Roline read that is the key. So here's the Lord speaking to Abraham. He says, your people are going to be enslaved, but I'm going to deliver them. I'm going to judge the nation. That's Egypt. We saw that in Exodus, how the Lord judged with ten plagues Pharaoh and his people, brought destruction upon them so that they were able to, to, to come out and be free. He says, don't worry. You're going to re reach a ripe old age. You're going to be... You never like the word ripe when it comes to old age, but um, you know what, the, what he's saying. He says, you're, you're going you're gonna to be, you're gonna be a, a fruitful. You're going to have, have those children. At this point, Ad, uh, Abraham still didn't have children. So he says, don't worry about that. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to fulfill the promises that I've made to you. But it's verse 16 that is the key. 
in the fourth and, and uh, Roline, you must have the NIV. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the study Bible. So that, but that's about the same as what mine has. Um, but in the New King James there it says, the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Correct? Mm-hmm. So the Amorites were the peoples who dwelled in the land of Canaan. The Amorites were kind of a summary of all of those Canaanite peoples, the, the Hivites, the Jebusites, all of those different nationalities. And what he's saying here is that he's going to send his people back there in order to judge also the heathen people of Canaan. And that's going to take place under Joshua and his conquest of the land. Now, a lot of people say, well, why would God do that? The, the, um, the iniquity, that's guilt, the punishment of the Amorite has not yet reached its full measure. In other words, judgment is coming upon those people. The reason God sent his people in to destroy them was because they had had 400 years to come to the knowledge of the Savior, the true God. They had rejected the true God. They had continued worshiping the false gods. And so in this case, God was judging those people for their sin and their rejection of him. The iniquity of the Amorite uh, is not yet complete. So in the Old Testament, God does use his people. He sends them in. He says, I am using you to judge these people. Now, God probably wouldn't have done that. He didn't do that with every heathen group, but he did it here because of what Charles said. He did not want those Canaanite and godless people who had rejected the Lord to influence the religion of his own people. If that happened, then there was a, there was, because, and we're going to see that actually happening in the future, but it, it ended up that they, their, their religion become, became watered down and the Lord had to step into history several times in the future in order to destroy the ten tribes of Israel under Sennacherib, king of Assyria, to lead the two tribes that remained into captivity in Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. Finally, he brought them back and the reason that he did all of that was so that he could fulfill his promise that we talked about earlier, which he made to Adam and Eve to send a savior. So he wanted to, I look at it in this sense that Um, God built a fence around the nation of Israel to protect them. And, you know, it's like like your garden. Um, I had radishes that were planted in the garden and the rabbits have been destroying them. Uh, You know, and and so the only way to take care of that is either to wipe them all out or, or, or to build a fence around in order to protect them, in order to keep them out. And so God does a little bit of both. He sends his people and he says, I want you to wipe them all out in order to protect, to preserve what I am going to do through you. And when they don't follow through on that, then he says he's going to, these laws that he, he in, puts in place, those are to protect, to put a barrier around his people in order to keep people away from them, to separate them from the peoples of of the world. So that's what we're going to see taking place in the book of Joshua. God has that intention. He's bringing judgment upon godless people who have already rejected him. And you say, well, wait a second. Were there any prophets that God sent to the Canaanite peoples of of those days? Think back to Genesis. And Abraham runs into a man by the name of Melchizedek, who was a priest before God and a king. He was one of those examples, as well as Abraham, of those who were preaching the gospel to those Canaanite peoples early on. It's not like God didn't care about them. He had sent them the the gospel message about who he was, what he had come come to do, what he was coming to do, but they were rejecting that salvation. They were putting their confidence in false gods. So that that is a that's a question that often comes up that that Atheists and others will bring up, well, God is such a vindictive person. He uh, wipes out all these people. Well, God is bringing judgment upon sin. And that's what we all deserve. The wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. And we should be thankful that the Lord has brought us to faith and has sent his son in order to deliver us. He wanted that for the, the Amorite people too. But when we reject Christ's salvation, then we get what we deserve. And that is, that is death. So any thoughts on Genesis 15 or the conquest of Canaan? Mm -hmm. 
it just seems like every nation now lasts about 400 years and then they go down. There certainly is a pattern there. Like the United States too. It's yep. Yep, that cycle, you take a look at Greece and Rome and other uh, powerful nations of the past, and you're right, that's about, the, that's about the time span, the cycle. So the book of Joshua can kind of be divided up into three different parts. Uh, chapter 1 through chapter 13 deals with the conquest of the land of Canaan. They're coming in and they're taking over. They're destroying Jericho. There's the battle of Ai, which they lose because Achan steals something. He takes something that he wasn't supposed to. Uh, then they conquer some of the other uh, cities and, and nations. There's also a little bit of discussion about these people that come in and they try to trick Joshua. Uh, they say that they were foreigners and they dressed up like they, were, they had come from a long ways away and they tricked Joshua into making a treaty with him. And then when he comes to take over their city, they come out and say, no, you made a treaty with us. Uh, so that was kind of the first part of that where they didn't follow through on what the Lord and what Moses had told them, you need to do this. You have to wipe these people out. The second part, starting in chapter 13 and going on into chapter 24, is uh, basically the division of the land where the tribes then settle in the in the, this promised land. And we talked a little bit about that with the map in Roline's Bible where the tribes come in, each tribe picks, picks an area, they settle in that land, uh, they, they finish the work of, of conquering it. And then the last couple of chapters in the book of Joshua deal with some, some other ground rules that are established. You have the establishment of the cities of refuge, um, the, the placement of the Levites, and then also, and then finally, the death of Joshua. So remember the Levites, if you take a look at that, the map that you have there. So let's see here, why don't we do this. Can you uh, read off for me the tribes that are listed there, Rolene, in your map? You've got Reuben on the, on the right side, and Gad, yeah. and Manasseh. And then on the other side, you've got, let's start at the bottom. So, Simeon. Simeon, I'll put Judah up here. Judah, Simeon, Benjamin. Uh, Dan. Asher. Zebulun. Let's see, Asher, Zebulun, who am I missing? Issachar, right? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm missing two. Joseph doesn't get one. Starts with an M. Naphtali. There we go. Thank you. Naphtali. I'm still missing one more. Dan, Asher, Zebulun, Issachar, Naphtali, Simeon, Reuben. And then E. E P H. Ephraim. Thank you. Now, the reason I put the, these, these are, the, these are the ones that inherited land in Israel. If we back up, though, to the book of Genesis, and we actually take a look at the sons of, remember, these are the 12 tribes of, of Israel. Israel was, what was his, his given name? No. No. Jacob, who was later given the name Israel, he had 12 sons through, remember there were four ladies, there was Rachel and Leah and then uh, Zola and Billa. Uh, so he has, he has 12 sons among them. So if you take a look at these 12 names that are inheritors of the promised land or tribes that inherit the promised land, and you compare them with the 12 sons of Israel, you're going to find some discrepancies. And people say, ah, see, there's a problem. Well, Reuben was the oldest. Judah, then you have Simeon, and you have one name that's not up here. Levi. And then there's another name of the sons that's not up here, and that's, somebody mentioned him earlier, Joseph. So you have Reuben, Gad, Judah, Simeon, Benjamin, Dan, Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali, Issachar, Levi, and Joseph. 
So the two that aren't on the list are Manasseh and Ephraim. So what happens is the Levites, they don't get an inheritance in the promised land. They become the ones that are in charge of the temple. Since you take Levi out, you double up Joseph. Joseph's two sons were Ephraim and Manasseh. So Joseph receives a double inheritance in the land of Canaan, one of his sons taking the place of Levi. Now, so we have 12 tribes. Joseph has two, but you still have this extra group. The Levites, their family went in there too. Joseph's divided into two, the other 11, but you've got Levi. Levi wasn't going to inherit. He was going to go into the promised land, but he wasn't going to inherit land. And this is where the tithe comes in, in the Old Testament. This is very important because a lot of people in the New Testament mix this all up. They say, oh, you have to give a tithe of your offerings today because they did it in the Old Testament. What was good for God in the Old Testament is good for God in the New Testament. Well, there was a historical situation and reason for the tithe. Each one of the 12 tribes, since Levi did not inherit land, he had to wait, get away to receive food. He couldn't grow crops because he didn't have any land. So each one of the 12 tribes every year would give a portion of their land, their cattle, their crops to the, the Levitical tribe in order for them to survive. So this is where the, the tithe comes in then in the Old Testament. The reason for the tithe was to support the Levitical priests. So the tithe does not apply in the New Testament. When the Old Testament was, was done away, when the Levitical, when the Levitical tribe was, was destroyed, wiped out, there was no more reason for the tithe. Now, when we take a look at our offerings, a tithe or a 10% is a good thing for us to think about. But anytime somebody comes and says New Testament Christians must give 10% because that's what they did in the Old Testament is taking it out of its context because there was a reason why that was done to support a group of people who did not have any way of earning and making a living. Uh, that was the reason for that. So that can be helpful as we take a look at people today in, in a lot of the non-denominational churches, Baptist churches, they enforce a tithe. Sometimes even in... Uh, Catholic churches, they will, they will do that type of thing and that's, it's taking it out of its historical context and putting it in today where it doesn't, it doesn't apply. So that's why there will be some differences between the 12 sons of Levi mentioned in Genesis and the 12 tribes that are actually listed and pictured in Joshua and then on the maps that we have because of this transition, Joseph receiving a double inheritance and the, the Levites receiving the tithe. And the last three chapters of Joshua talk a little bit about the, the Levitical priesthood and how they are supported by, by the other tribes of Israel. And then the, the cities of refuge were cities that were set up within the promised land that a person could run to if, um, if his life was in danger, if he had done something that was wrong and people were going to take the law into their own hands, they could run to the city of refuge and get a, a fair trial in essence. So they set up a type of a legal defense in the, as they settled the, the promised land as well. So we're 100% of the old traditions or whatever, those regulations. When the Savior died and the, and the curtain was torn, is that all over with then for the Old Testament or not? How much of that, is anything retained at all? Yes, this goes back a little bit to what we talked about. Oh, you weren't here last week. Last week we talked about the three different types of laws in the, in the book of Exodus and Leviticus. So does ever, anybody remember what those three groups were, those three categories? Civil, so, we, so we have civil laws, <laughs> ceremonial laws, and moral laws. So the civil laws were laws that, well, let's start with the ceremonial laws. The ceremonial laws would have been the sacrifices that God intended, the cleanliness laws, all of those things. You couldn't eat certain things, you could eat other things. Those were ceremonial laws. What sacrifices to bring when you did this or when you didn't do that, those were ceremonial laws. Then you have the moral law, that's the Ten Commandments. 
you have, uh, you know, you shall honor your father and mother, you shall not steal. Those are the, the moral laws. The civil laws were laws that enforced the moral law and the ceremonial law and also then governed the nation as a whole. So when, when Jesus came, and for example, in Colossians chapter 2, where he says, let no one judge you regarding food or drink, those are ceremonial laws, or festivals or new moons or Sabbaths, he says those things are, are of the past. They point to Christ. They are the shadow of Christ, but the substance is found in Christ. So when Jesus comes, the ceremonial and the civil, in fact, the civil actually went away even before that. When we get into Samuel and they request a king, you get Saul and David. Even then, to some degree, the civil sort of goes away. There are certainly times during the history of God's people in the Old Testament where they didn't carry out the, the ceremonial laws. But the moral law, that transcends, and that's for all people of all time. So, each one of the Ten Commandments, and that's recorded in Exodus chapter 20, is found repeated in the New Testament in one way or another. Uh, you shall not steal, you shall not kill. So, we know what the moral law, but the civil and ceremonial law, those laws were done away with in, in Christ. So we don't need to not eat certain foods today. We don't need to uh, practice certain uh, cleanliness laws as far as washing our hands. Uh, those things are part of the ceremonial. We don't have to offer certain sacrifices, guilt offerings, things like that. So that's a good question. And that's something that comes up all the time too. You know, they say, well, you know, they used to stone people to death in the Old Testament. Well, that was the civil law. We don't stone people to death for breaking the moral law or even ceremonial laws because that was part of the theocracy. God was the one who was the, the ruler. A couple of neat things about the book of Joshua. One of, one of the things that whenever you're reading through the Old Testament, you want to kind of keep an eye out for is where is Christ? Do you find Christ in this book? And in every book of the Bible you will find Christ. Even in Esther, although we'll get into that when we get to, get to her. Um, in Genesis, we find, we find Jesus in the promise of the Savior to Adam and Eve. We find Jesus in, appearing to Abraham as the angel of the Lord. So we get all of these different places in which Jesus is pointed to or described. And we find that in the book of Joshua also. Uh, let's go to Joshua chapter 5. First of all, Joshua, I don't know if you were aware of this, but Joshua is actually the name of Jesus. So Joshua, in Hebrew it's Yeshua. That's Hebrew. Now remember, Jesus was Hebrew. He was Jewish. But Yeshua is Jesus in Greek. So he's best known as Jesus, but if you were actually alive and you were in the house of Mary and Joseph, they would have been saying, Yeshua, Yeshua, come here. Uh, that would have been his name. That would have been what they called him. We have the translation of his name into a different language, into Greek, so we call him Jesus. So there's the first parallel. That Joshua and Jesus have the same name. It means uh, Jehovah is Savior, in essence. But now think about what Joshua did. What did Joshua do? He took over for a leader, Moses, who died. And he leads the people into the promised land. He gives them rest. What does Jesus do? He steps up as the leader of his people. And he leads us into the promised land of heaven through his death and resurrection. The writer to the Hebrews makes that parallel. Um, in chapter 4, the writer to the Hebrews says that if Moses or Joshua had given the people rest, then they'd still have it. 
But no, Jesus has opened up the door to heaven. He has given us rest. So Joshua is a picture of Jesus in the Old Testament. Just as he delivered the children of Israel into the promised land, so also Jesus would come and bring uh, people into the promised land of heaven through his death and resurrection. So that's one of the similarities that you have in in the book of Joshua. I'd like to take a look at this reference though in Joshua 5 verse 13. Uh, it starts there and this is kind of an interesting, this is just as the children of Israel are getting ready to, to conquer, to move in and conquer the land of, of Israel. And Joshua is kind of spying things out. He's taking a look at what's going on in the land of, of Israel and it's a kind of a daunting thing like it was 40 years earlier. But he runs into this guy uh, verse 13, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua approached him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? I mean, that would be a pretty daunting thing, wouldn't it? You're walking down the road and you see a guy and he's got a gun out, you know, and it's pointing at you. He's got the sword out and he says, friend or foe, you know, who, whose side are you on? He and he was capital. Yes, yes, we're going to get to that. Uh, verse uh, 14, uh, do you want to go on there, Charles? So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does the Lord say to his servant? Keep going, one more verse. Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. So we have some striking things here. We wonder about this commander of the uh, uh, Lord's army, but you'll notice a couple of striking things. First of all, what does Joshua do when he finds out who this person is? Okay, he, he bows down before him. He humbles himself before him with his face to the ground in worship. That's a very important word there. He recognizes that this is God himself. And you'll notice that the guy does not say, for example, when people come to, to worship Paul, Paul says, don't bow down, don't worship, to, you don't worship me. There's only one person you should worship, and that's God. Well, this commander of the Lord's army doesn't say, don't worship me. It's not an, if, it, if it were an angel, the angel would say, don't worship me. We have examples of that in both the Old and the New Testament too. Don't worship Re Revelation. We had one a couple of weeks ago. John, um, John wants to bow down and worship the angel, and the angel says, don't worship me. I'm, I'm not God. And then, in the last verse, the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, remove your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. What, how, why does that sound familiar? Because that's what the Lord said. To whom? Who did he say that to? Why are those... Yeah, to Moses at the burning bush. Remember when the Lord appeared to Moses in the burning bush and he says, take your sandals off your feet for the place that you're standing is holy ground. So this is again God's way of speaking to Moses. That's what he did to Moses before when he called Moses into service. When he comes before Joshua, he tells Joshua the same thing. He says, I am going to be with you. Trust in me and, and we will get through this. So this uh, commander of the Lord's army is is God. It is Jesus himself appearing to Joshua, encouraging him in the work that he is about to undertake as he, he leads the people into the, the promised land. And he says, I'm, I'm going to be with you. One of the neat things about the book of Joshua is that these are a bunch of farmers. You know, they've been, they've been wandering around for 40 years. They didn't know weapons. They didn't know how to fight. And what does the Lord do over the, this 10-year, this 15-year period? He delivers one after another the peoples into their hand. Just like in Jericho. They didn't do a thing. They marched around the city and the walls came down. And the Lord had done all of that saying, I'm going to deliver this into your hand. You don't have to worry about it. It's not by your power. It's not by your might. I'm going to be the one who's going to give this into your hands. Trust in me. So any thoughts on, on Joshua? Well, when they were in the Coming into the promised land, now all that land was very arable and, and productive, and, and now it seems not to be. Is that, you know, that's what the... There, if you actually take a look at, at um, it depends on where you are. The land that they inherited, though, is actually very, very fertile. It reminds me a lot of southern Minnesota. Uh, they grow a lot of different crops. 
Uh, I mean, they still have the olives, the, the grapes that they grow. It takes a certain climate for that. So I, I wondered that too. You see some pictures, if you're down by the Dead Sea, that's very, very dry down there. And there are the ups and the downs. So you might see pictures just like in our own country where things aren't as wet as you would like them to be and, and the crops aren't growing as well. But it is, it's, it's a very, very fertile, fertile area. Any other thoughts? Well, it seems to me like that was very well populated and when the Lord told them to kill all these people, that must have been a... They didn't really start out that way to kill. When they started coming into the land of Canaan, they did. But not, not if you go back to Abraham. At that point, when the Lord gave that land to Abraham, you know, they were supposed to settle that and they would have, they were more um, herdsmen at that point. It wasn't like you owned a certain amount of land. They, they shared, remember when Lot comes in there and, and he says, I'll go one way and you go the other way. And they had to share with other people. So it was more of a, a um, gypsy type mentality, you know, where you kind of traveled from place to place. But at this point now, it has been pretty well infested. With and cities. With and cities and peoples yeah. and, yep. And and so, I can probably see why they didn't kill them. I mean, your natural instinct right. would be to save the babies anyway, right. or, or, right. you know, or something, or the animals. But yeah. Well, and what's interesting, we're going to see this as we go into the book of, Ju of Judges now. Because the children of Israel did not follow through on what the Lord told them to do, we're going to see some pretty ugly things taking place in the book of Judges. The book of Judges is probably one of the darkest pictures of the history of God's people in the whole Old Testament. It starts off where, where you, you see some of the problems that they have because they didn't drive all the people out, so God would raise up a judge. And we get this cycle that takes place in the book of Judges. You, we talk about the cycle, and we see this already in the, in the uh, books of Numbers and Deuteronomy. But you get this cycle that takes place throughout the, um, this period of, of time where uh, the Lord gives them prosperity. And as a result of the prosperity, uh, the people become um, idolatrous. You know, they, they begin worshiping false gods. They don't trust in the Lord anymore. And so then the Lord sends a judgment against his people with a foreign nation. And the foreign nation comes in and oppresses the children of Israel. Uh, then they repent. And he sends a deliverer. So this cycle happens over and over and over again in, in the period of the judges. And one of the things that, that is probably helpful to keep in mind when we're going through the period of the judges, this covers, this covers about 400 years or so also. I'm going to pass this around. But this has the, the names of the judges listed on here. And one of the things we have to remember is that the Lord would raise up a judge in a certain area or for a certain tribe. There might be three judges that are alive all at the same time, but they're judging certain tribes. There is no, there's no, um, no federal government in the land of Israel at this point in their history. There's local governments. They are, they're ruled by God, but as far as a civil a manner, they, they are governing things individually within their tribes or their regions or their cities. And so when problems arise and people are disobedient, then he brings up judgment against them and it might be just one tribe or maybe two tribes. There are a couple that it's the entire nation of Israel, but we kind of have to keep that in mind as we're going through and studying the judges. You get a judge like, the other thing that's interesting, as you're looking at the judges, um, so in the book of Judges, who's the first judge that's mentioned? He's one of the last, well, he's probably the last one. The opening, the opening book, uh, the opening section, of the book of uh, Judges. Judah. 
Well, the first couple of chapters are, are more uh, talking about the, the history there. Samson's later on. So the first judge is in chapter 3, verse 7. Oh, yes, yeah, they're good, good name. Othniel. And then after Othniel, you have who? Ehud. And after Ehud, who do you have after that? Shamgar. Shamgar, good. Then comes Deborah. Okay, then you have Deborah, D E B O R A H. Different than my Deborah. Deborah and Barak is sometimes included in that list. Okay, we know a little bit about Gideon. Who's after Gideon? I think you might have... Zeba and There are a couple of them that are hardly mentioned at all. Uh, let's see. You've got Abimelech in chapter 9. Tola only has two verses on him in chapter 10. Uh, verses 1 and 2. Tola has just a little bit written about him. You've got Jer. Jephthah in chapter 10. We have a little bit more information about Jephthah. We know a little bit about Gideon. Then you've got Isban, uh, Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon, who we hardly know anything about. Each one of those is just one or two verses about each one of those judges. And what's kind of interesting, then you get down to the bottom, you get Samson. And, and so you kind of have this, this drop-off when it comes to the judges of Israel. Othniel, if you read about Othniel in chapter 3, he's, he's uh, an outstanding person. And then we get to some of these other ones we don't know a whole lot. You have um, you know, the stake in the forehead uh, where they, they drive a tent peg through, through the, bad, the bad guy's head. Gideon has a lot of questions. He has a lot of concerns when God comes to him and he says, I want you to be the judge. Gideon's kind of like Moses. That, not me. You know, it's, I'm just a farmer. You, know, you don't want me to, to do that. And the Lord has to press him into that. Then you get down to Samson. And man, did that guy have problems. I mean, who, why would God use a guy like this? This guy, he married, married a bad woman to begin with and that, that didn't turn out well. So he marries another bad woman. That turns out even worse. And, and he doesn't learn his lesson. He, she says, come on in. You know, what, what's the secret of your strength? And, and he lies to her. He says, oh, you know, you have to bind me up in, in new, fresh ropes. And so what does she do? She binds him up in new, fresh ropes. And they come in and, and they take him away. And he breaks through the ropes. And, and, he, and she says, oh, no, what's the secret of your strength? And he doesn't learn his lesson. He says, hmm, I can't quite figure this out. Where is, where is this going? So he tells her a different lie and that doesn't work out. Finally, he tells her the truth. If you cut my hair, it's all over with. They put out his eyes and they lock him up. So Samson was just a, not what you would want in a judge. So there's this kind of this downward spiral in, in the book of Judges through the, the, the judges that God raises up. And, and as you're going down and you're, you're seeing this, it shows you the darker and the darker depravity that the children of Israel are falling into because they did not carry out the Lord's command to kick out and, and wipe out the nations. You know, they're being, they're being afflicted and tempted by these false gods. Um, you hear about some of these guys uh, later on after Samson, there's a, there's a guy by the name of Dan and, and, or from the tribe of Dan and, and he, he has an idol, Micah his name is. He's got an idol in his house and he worships it. And all kinds of bad things that are going on. Now, there are a couple of other interesting things um, as you read through some of these, these judges. At the end then you get to Samuel. Um, you have Eli. And then Samuel, which is going to introduce us into the book of, of 1 and 2 Samuel. But Samuel, while he was a good judge, he was the last of the judges, he made a lot of mistakes too. We're, we're told that neither Eli nor Samuel did a good job in raising their children. Their children were literally worthless. Um, Eli's sons were killed in battle when the Ark of the Covenant was taken. And uh, they died, he died, he fell over in his chair. Samuel's sons weren't any better. 
uh, Samuel was that little boy that was brought into the temple. Uh, Hannah says, I'm going to dedicate him to the Lord because the Lord answered her prayer for a son. He's raised by Eli in essence, but he doesn't do a good job of raising his boys either. And they become priests and they are taking bribes from people and, and giving certain judgments. So, and, and the people know both with Eli's sons and Samuel's sons, that they're not good, they're not just people. Uh, they're, they're horrible. So we have this pretty ugly picture that's painted in the book of Judges. But again, if we, we back up to the, the main message of the book of Judges, it's a reminder that the Lord, while He judges our wickedness, He also saves those who repent and trust in Him. And that's probably one of the main messages of the book of Judges in a very, very uh, discouraging way. He says, if you want to go along in your sin, this is what's going to happen. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be dark. But if you trust in me, you turn your sins over to me, then things are going to work out well. I will bless the results of that. And so if as you're reading through this history of the children of Israel, which is pretty discouraging, it is a reminder of how Christ is there. And because of Christ as our deliverer, we do have hope. We do have prosperity in, in eternity because of what Christ has done for us. So this can be a kind of a tough book to get through. There's a lot of ugly things that happen in the book of Judges, especially in the, the latter chapters uh, before you get into to Samuel. There, there is in chapters, uh, well, chapter 16 is the last chapter that deals with Samson. And then chapters 17, 18, and 19 are, you kind of get away from the judges a little bit, but you get, you get this idea of the idolatry that was taking place, the, the wickedness that was all over in the land. And we're just talking about a couple of generations away from Joshua. The end of Joshua, we have those familiar words. Joshua says, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So you have that, that encouragement at the end of Joshua, but it didn't take long and the people fell away from that and began worshiping these false gods and receiving then the Lord's judgment as a result. Well, any, any thoughts or questions on judges? We didn't get through uh, Ruth and Samuel like I was hoping to. Ruth is a short book, only four chapters long. Uh, just, you, this is probably a familiar book, but one of the main messages of the book of Ruth is that she was also a foreigner like Rahab was. She, but the Lord saved her. He brought her into his family, made her a part of his people. That's kind of an important reminder for us that even though we are Gentiles, we're not Jewish, the Lord brings us into his family through faith in Christ. She became an ancestress of David. She was the great, great grandmother of David, King David. And remember that David was an ancestor of Jesus. So she became an ancestress of the Savior, even though she was a foreigner, a Moabitess. Uh, some beautiful pictures of Christ in the book of Ruth also. Uh, the Boaz as the kinsman redeemer, uh, which is a picture of buying someone back. Uh, Boaz had to purchase the land of Naomi's family. And then through, through marriage, he... Uh, he saves them in essence. And so the kinsman redeemer in the Old Testament is a picture of Jesus also, how he comes and he, he gives his life in order to pay the debt in order to make us his own. So some beautiful pictures of Christ in the book of Ruth too. And then in First and Second Samuel, you get into the kings. We'll, we'll take a look at that the next time. But uh, Samuel talks a little bit about the fact that the people rejected the the. The judges, Samuel was the last of those judges, and they say, we don't want judges anymore. We want a king. We want to be like all the nations around us. So God chooses Saul. Saul becomes king. And then Samuel is going to take us, First and Second Samuel is going to take us through the, the kingship of Saul and David, in essence. So we're going to see the transition from the first king of Israel under Saul. He started off good. He became bad. Uh, and then we have the anointing of David under, under him, after him, and all of the, the difficulties that David went through. So that'll be the next section that we will we'll get into in, in the next two books. At the very end of the group, it gives the genealogy. Yes, yep, uh, Obed, uh, Jesse, 
and then David. So uh, Boaz, let's see, that's right, right? Boaz was the father, Boaz and Ruth were the father of Obed, correct? Mm -hmm. King Jesse. Yep, Obed, Jesse, and, and David. You know, by this time Moses was dead, I, who really wrote all these? That's a good question. I've never been able to find an answer to we, that. We don't know in most of these the cases of, well, in a lot of the cases of the Old Testament, we don't know who the writers were, especially in the historical books. Um, there is a good chance that some of the, some of the priests might have been involved in, in writing some of these down. Uh, Samuel has been mentioned as a possible uh, author or writer of some of these books. Uh, he could have, it's hard, Joshua may not have been able to write the entire book because it records his death at the end, just like Deuteronomy records Moses' death. So there's two ways to take a look at that. Either Moses recorded his own death by inspiration or the last chapter was added by Joshua. Same thing with Joshua. Joshua could have been the author of the book of Joshua, but most likely that was probably written later on also throughout the book of Joshua. You hear this phrase, as it is to this day. So he's, whoever the, the writer is, he's looking back and he's saying the same thing is true now as it was back then. So Samuel has been suggested as, a, as an author or writer for the book of, of Judges, possibly also Ruth. And he could have written a large portion of First and Second Samuel too, uh, but there may have been others that were involved in that later on. But most, a lot of the books of the Old Testament do not tell us who, who the writers were. Like the judges, would they have written those books? I mean, they, they may have, but again, with it covering a shorter period of time, it, part of that was probably handed down by either uh, some kind of a written form or even vocally through families, and then they were recorded later on by, by someone else. Or, you know, simply, it, we don't even need to have that if, if the Lord is the author. He could record anyone to write down his history, just like Moses in Genesis. You know, the history and the, and the creation of the world. There was no, nobody to pass that down. Uh, God just simply gave that by inspiration. So any questions on Joshua, Judges, or Ruth? Hopefully this book has is, is been kind of helpful just as a, a, a brief synopsis of the books as you're going through them. Again, the whole idea is to kind of get the, the big picture as we're going through this and to see how each one of these books is important in pointing us to the fulfillment of God's plan of salvation. And we'll see that in the book of Kings and, and Chronicles. We'll get in the book of Psalms next, next time and take a look at the, the diversity of that book and how those books all point to, to Jesus and, and God's salvation and preservation too. Well, why don't we close with the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.